Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us a very special guest, Ms. Helen Lechner. She studied social anthropology at SOAS in the 1960s. She had a long career in direct involvement in social aspects of rural development in more than 30 countries, including the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Europe. She's also an analyst, author, and speaker on the crisis in Yemen, where she has spent more than 15 years during the past half century. Ms. Lechner, welcome to Indian Global Left. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I look forward to having an interesting conversation. It's such a pleasure to have you on. I mean, you have been writing about Yemen for a period longer than my own age. Uh, I recently read your book uh, uh, that you probably wrote in uh, the 1980s on, yeah, on socialist mm -hmm. Yemen. And so I thought it's a good time to have a, a podcast to bring out some of the histories and politics of the region. Uh, obviously, the region has come to the news because of the genocide that we are seeing in Gaza and the heroic intervention of the Houthis. But sadly, our, our knowledge, including myself, about, the, about Yemen is limited to, at best, the civil war, sometimes as statistical figures in this, uh, you know, developmental reports. And, and so I wanted to bring uh, out to, to have you on to tell us a little bit about Yemen's history from its own perspective. So if we could start with a little bit about what Yemen looked like at, at the time of its independence in 1960s, and if you could give us a sense of this division between uh, North Yemen and South Yemen, to what extent was it a division of British colonialism and Arab imamate and the tribal statelets, and to what extent it was a product of the Cold War? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, before we come to the 60s, it's important to note really that the divisions between what became the Yemen Arab Republic and what became the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen really, uh, really can be marked as the end of the First World War. Because at that point, you had the, the end of the Ottoman involvement in what then was North Yemen. And, you, and that created the Mutawakilite Kingdom, which was an independent state. And in the south, or we've had the Aden and the protectorates from 1839 onwards. So really what happened in, in 1918 or in the following years, was the definition of a border between these two states, except that I'm not sure you can call the British protectorate states because really, you know, the, the protectorates were not really, they were not ruled by Britain. I mean, Britain just had weird agreements whereby it gave their local rulers that, the, sorry, the local rulers that they liked, they gave him a few guns uh, against the particular ones that they didn't like. And that's also one reason why that particular set of border, when you look between, you know, between the Bab al-Mandab and basically the Rubra al-Khali, the, the deserts, so what are now the, the number of governorates, you know, cut across uh, tribal lines or, if, you know, social group lines or even villages, where you have half a village on one side, half on the other due to some, you know, peculiar incident of a relationship. So, you know, this the separation between these two states as they became is definitely way before the, um, the Cold War. Um, and But it did develop. I mean, in the 1960s, you then had the revolution in the Yemen Arab Republic, which overthrew the Emirate and got very close and was supported and basically more or less kept alive by Nasser's troops, who had up to 70,000 troops in Yemen at various points between 1962 and 1970. And they also help the development and the emergence of the National Liberation Front in the British Aden protectorates, which eventually gained power. And again, I'm not sure how much we want to go into details of that, because you also had a, a rival liberation movement in the Aden and the protectorates, which was much closer to Nasser, 
then the then the NLF, which eventually uh, gained independence from Britain. I don't know if you want me to go into that now, or you want to to go into some other detail first. Um, if you can just tell us a little bit about what led to the rise of the NLF, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's the important element because you know there's not only the rise of the NLF, there's also the changes within the NLF, right. But the, initially, the rise of the NLF, by comparison with its rival, which was the FLOSI, the Front for Liberation of Occupied South Yemen, which was much closer to NASA, the big fundamental difference is that some elements of the NLF, not all, but some of them, you know, emerged from the movement of Arab nationalists, which is a movement that developed in the early 50s and was led by Palestinians, and for, which also produced, you know, all the really left-wing movements in the Arab world, including in Palestine, both the people's, uh, the, sorry, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. So you had this, you know, again, within the MAN, like so many of the outfits, you had divisions and splits, but basically the NLF or a main element of the NLF and the one that became the dominant element after independence was the element that was connected with the left wing, with the, say the influence from the left wing elements of the movement of Arab nationalists through some of its leading members who also studied in the American University of Beirut, where basically that movement originated. Yeah. And what were the relationship, what was the relationship of the NLF with the Ba'athists and the communists? Um, well, that again changed over time um, uh, in very considerably. And certainly once, you, you know, after independence, which in the PDRY start was in 1967, you, so the NLF basically won over Flossi a few months before independence. And that's the reason why the British negotiated independence with them, which was an incredibly rushed negotiation that took barely a week, if I remember rightly. Uh, but the, the important, and I think one of the reasons the British signed with the NLF rather than with Flossi is because they regarded Flossi as being Nasserist. And if you look back at that period, as far as Britain was concerned, you know, Nasserism was the devil incarnate, you know, rather like Iran is to, to all the northern Westerners at the moment. So and and also the uh, incredibly high level of ignorance of the nature of the NLF. I mean, the, you look at read some of the memoirs of people at that time and talk to them. They basically, you know, suddenly found themselves facing at the uh, at the negotiation table guys who had been working for them in their offices in some lowly job and whom they'd never even suspected of having had any political involvement. So immediately after independence in 67, you had a, a series of moves in the PDRY, which led to the exclusion of the more tribal elements and of the other non, non, you know, non left wing movements. But at the same time, you know, the Ba'athist movement existed in a minor form, but it was there, you know, as it was, I think, throughout the Arab world, as were well, indeed the communists. And over the decade between 67 and 77, they got closer and closer together. And by, I forget the exact dates now, but they are in the book. I think by 1975, they had basically merged, in, integrated into what then was known as the UPONF, the United Political Organization, the National Front. It included- Yeah, probably 1972. Well, it's 72. Okay, um, you've read this more recently than I have. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there were three or four different stages because there, there was the PONF and then there was the UPONF. But anyway, you know, basically by the mid 70s, the communists and the Ba'athists had been integrated into the National Front, into, into what was then called the National Front, or which was the NLF, basically, which in 1978 became the Yemeni Socialist Party and was the ruling party until, until unification, basically, in 1990. So, so you you know you had you had this uh, increasing connection between more left wing movements and at the same time a more exclusion of the movements that were say exclusively nationalist rather than being socialist as well. 
Mm -hmm. And you also really need to remember, and again, I'm not sure if you want us to talk about this in more detail, but, you know, in its, in its, basically throughout its existence, but particularly in the first 10 years of its existence, the PDRY was really under siege because all the neighboring states were, you know, not some in some cases fighting them directly militarily, but certainly making every possible effort they could to undermine them. And we're supporting, you know, all the, the, the right wingers as well as the sort of the what was existed of the bourgeoisie of the or at independence who basically all migrated, particularly when you had the the you know nationalization of various properties and of um of various industries, etc. So most of these people moved either to what was then the Yemen Arab Republic in Salah. Or the and and some of them moved their factories to to other cities in the YR or to Saudi Arabia, um, and and a few went elsewhere. But anyway, those were the two main destinations. So you know you had this this sort of alliance or, or merger of different left wing movements in the PDRY, who felt very very attacked. I mean, they felt really under siege from from the the neighboring states plus the 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 those who had left Yemen and because they didn't like them who also joined these uh, this the, these sort of sieges so i think that was that's a very important element in terms of explaining the the really unhealthy politics i would say of that of that period of the of the pdry period one of the interesting uh things that I found in your book um, was the hostility of the neighboring Arab states, not just the conservative uh, states like Saudi Arabia, but the quote unquote progressive states like Syria, uh, Iraq, and Egypt at the Egypt at the time where the Baptist movements were very strong. And they they supported the FLSOY and 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 there was a great hostility towards the uh the the People's uh, PDR. eventually PDR, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, was it a hostility towards socialism, or was it a hostility to hostility towards the rural uh, urban divide? Because one of the things you mention in your book is that the FLSOY, the you know, supported by partly trade unionists, Nas Nasserite, urban intellectuals, they had very little idea about what was going on in rural Yemen. Could mm -hmm. you spell out a little bit about that? Well, I think, you know, to get to the beginning of your question, I mean, if you look at Egypt, you know, basically by the time, you know, after the 1967 defeat, uh, Nasserism ended. I mean, Nasser died very briefly after in 1970. And so as soon, you know, the, the, you then immediately had a right wing regime in, in Egypt. So why, you know, why Egypt was against them, I think is pretty straightforward because it wasn't by in any way a socialist regime. I think if you're going to talk about the Ba'athists in Iraq and, and Syria, you really also have to look at the fact that, you know, they're both Ba'athists and they hated each other's guts as much as um, as anybody else. So, you know, they, they were very exclusivist. And I think you have to look also at the, their policies, although all those states were close to the Soviet Union and getting support from the Soviet Union. And, um, can't, certainly Syria did. I can't remember how much Iraq did. Um, you know, they were not states that were anyway socialist in the same way as the PDRY. I think, you know, if you look at the nature of the regimes, of the way they ran the countries, of, you know, of the, the popular involvement, etc. I mean, I think, you know, you need to really look very carefully at the nature of Ba'athism, which really, I think... You know, I thought it at the time, and I certainly think it now, you know, doesn't really qualify as a description as being socialist. They may use the word, but I can think of plenty of others who've used the word in a highly inappropriate manner, in my view. So here is this a very fascinating thing about Yemen, right? I mean, we generally think about socialist states and we think about the Soviet Union or you know, China at the time. But here is this very tiny place. 
in 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 a in a remarkably unfavorable conditions uh they they come to power and then they execute some of these uh reforms which are very uh significant i'm thinking about nationalization of uh means of production land reforms the family reforms that you talk about in book uh providing uh very important rights uh for women so can you talk can you talk a little bit about about what did they achieve uh even before we move into the 1990s mm. yeah i think it, i mean it it was a unique experiment and really also you know a surprising one because as you said it was a, it's, it had 2 million inhabitants the pdry it was a small i mean geographically it's quite large but mm-hmm. it's mostly desert so you're talking about a small country you're talking about an incredibly poor country you know, at the time of independence, it had two sources of income. One was the Port of Aden and the other one was the British presence. But the British presence obviously left. And the Port of Aden was paralyzed until 1975 because of the closure of the Suez Canal. So hardly anything came through it. So it lost, you know, it lost all its standard sources of income. I mean, no oil was discovered till the late 80s. So, you know, it was particular. And I think what is particularly interesting there is that, you know, despite the considerable faction fighting that happened within the NLF and the Socialist Party, you know, they they had a very fundamental, serious commitment to improving the living conditions of the people. And, you know, one of the things that I always think of as a major achievement is that throughout that period, you know, somehow or other, mostly through, through loans and grants, including from the World Bank and such like, uh, they managed to make sure that the average family could live from its standard official income. It couldn't live in luxury, but it could live adequately. You know, you could they could eat adequate food, they could clothe the family and the children, they could get new clothes for Eid, you know, and they could live at a minimum living standard that is acceptable by, by I would say, by international standards. You know, they provided an excellent education system. I mean, sorry, excellence probably overstating the case. You know, it wasn't Oxford University or, or, or Harvard. But, you know, primary school, secondary school and university were, were there, were developed, were expanded. Um, and, they, you know, at one point when after the the after the uh, Egyptians agree, made their agreement with Israel, they threw out all the Egyptian th- teachers. So suddenly the secondary schools, mostly the secondary schools, but also primary schools, were kind of left more or less without teachers. And the response to that was to send all secondary school graduates to do a sort of two-year national service teaching around different places in the country. So, you know, that was a, a, an important thing to do. I mean, there were some foreign teachers left. They were basically the the the, the Arab communist exiles, mainly from Sudan and Egypt, who, who you know, who did stay, and, and of course, a few Palestinians. But the majority of teachers became Yemeni more or less instantly in, in 78, 79. And so, you know, although the quality, but again, you know, the syllabus was focused on on modern skills. And so there was, you know, this facility, this ability to create a, a, a labor force or a society of educated people. And they also provided, you know, basic health care and managed to open a medical school and produce their own doctors. You know, a lot of that with Cuban help. So it was, you know, it was a very important basic living standards you know could uh, were were reasonable and m- far more reasonable than what is seen in many places today and i think that to me that is the biggest achievement they they made and you know i think they had a number they had a number of external constraints as we just talked about you know particularly basically they were perceiving that they were under siege, but it wasn't just a perception, it was a reality. They were under siege, you know. I mean, you know, it's not, the, the Americans definitely didn't like them, the Saudis definitely didn't like them, etc. So, and and we're trying to undermine them one way or the other. So, you know, they, they were right to be worried, but I, I mean, I think the, the reaction to that was the wrong reaction, because what it was is a lot more infighting and a lot more purges, which, you know, I think was the main failure of that regime. It was basically, 
the you know the inability to you know to 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 address this siege in the in the best possible way i think it's you know very difficult to to really blame them because you really have to start imagining the the sort of psychosocial uh position people are in in that kind of environment uh, but I think that was, you know, that that was the, the really important thing. But if you want to see it again, you know, at a more international level, what happened there in the late 60s couldn't have happened in 20 years later or even 20 years earlier. I mean, it happened in the context of the independence movements throughout Africa. It happened in the context of the Vietnam War. It happened in the context of the liberation wars in, in Portuguese Africa. You know, it, and a lot of, I mean, there was a, an atmosphere and a, an overall perception. I mean, even for us here in, in, in Europe, you know, we had our events of 68, which were pretty pathetic by comparison with all that. But, you know, there, there was a sort of perception of a new type of socialism that could that would provide, you know, good living conditions to everybody everywhere. I mean, talking 50 years later, one's just thinking, you know, this was dreamland and, and you know, looking back on it with much nostalgia and regret and trying to think what, what we did wrong. But that's that's another story. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go into that now. Yeah, I mean, in, to that extent, I guess uh, uh, South Yemen was not an exception uh, going by history of uh, radical socialist experiments. They have often come at the moment of crisis when the older states uh, break down, you know, right from the Paris Commune, the Russian Revolution, mm. Chinese Revolution, and so on and so forth. It generally within these, you know, moments where colonial states break down, they open up opportunities from people from below to assert. Uh, um, I Before we move on to the 1990s, if you can just very briefly speak a little bit about status of women. And I want to want you to say a little bit because there is this huge perception probably lately, probably since the 1990s that, that women in the Arab world are like particularly oppressed and that is used to you know present this you know uh, imagery of Islam being backward perpetually you know not being reformed for thousands of years and so on and so forth so can, can you give us a sense of what was the status of women in the 50s and the 60s and even 70s uh, and what were some of the reforms that they they undertook well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, and, and I think some of them are deliberately spread about the status of women, you know, in, in the Muslim and Arab world in general. Uh, I mean, one of the things that always strike me is, you know, they're talking about women being secluded and locked up and not able to do anything. And I've also worked a lot in Africa. And in a lot of African countries, they're absolutely by no means secluded, locked up, etc., etc. They have to do even more work. You know, they, they not only have to do all the responsibilities that, that women in Yemen had, but they also have to go to the market and sell in the market and buy in the market and do absolute. So basically, they're even more oppressed, in my view, in the sense that they are, you know, they have even more tasks and even less autonomy in decision making. Where certainly in Yemen you had a situation, and you still have it to, to some extent, you know, where this division between the sort of male sphere and the female sphere, sphere gives women in the female sphere a lot of authority. And that's, you know, within the household and even beyond nowadays. And also in terms of activities. I mean, there, there's, a, there's also, an, and there, that I think always exists, there's a big gap between ideology and reality. I mean, the most crass example of that I, I'll always remember is I was standing on the edge of a field talking to a male farmer about the tasks that men and women do in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And he said to me absolutely firmly, like all the others, you know, women do not plow. Plowing is entirely a male activity. Right behind him was his wife plowing the field at the time he was talking to me. You know, and I have plenty of other examples of that kind of situation. You know, so ideologically, women do not plow. But in practice, they do. But basically, you stand and you see them, but they're going to tell they don't do it. So I think that that's a very, you know, very important thing. What the law did in the PDRY is that it, it did not make 
uh, polygamy illegal, illegal, but it made it extremely difficult to implement because of the conditions that were set, so that it reduced very, very considerably. And not that it, I mean, in, in Yemen and most Muslim countries, or at least Arab countries that I know, you very rarely have more than 10% of, of families that are, are bigamous, you know, whereas, for example, in, in certain places in Africa, it's a much higher percentage. And that's because of a very different uh, economic relationship within the household mm -hmm. and, and this kind of thing. Again, you know, a complicated story that one can go into. But, uh, but the law basically, you know, one, you had this family law, which did give women far more. So it was legally said that men and women are equally responsible for the maintenance of the household. Therefore, you know, women would be expected to also go out and get a job. And men would also be expected to do more work at home. Though in general, Yemeni men are extremely good and kind and, and very good with children. But I must say, I don't know many of them who do cooking and cleaning. <laughs> so, so, you know, they, there's a different level there. And the other thing that the family law and the, these equality laws did is that because of the Women's Union, which was an official organization, it, for example, made it much easier or much more possible for a young woman who, whose parents say wanted to ma marry her too young or to somebody she didn't like, it made it much more possible for her to try and resist this because she could, she could get the backing of the women's union and the local authorities to prevent being forced into a marriage that they didn't want to do. So, so that what it created was the, the facilities and the possibility for women to be more autonomous. And I mean, if you look at the situation in the mid 80s, for example, the the Ed Education College of Aden University, which was pretty much, I think, the biggest college, you know, you walked into that college and you would, you would not be, you know, it would not be surprising if you came out of there and said, this is a women's college, because there were so few men around that, you know, you wouldn't have assumed that men were students there. There were some, but it was mainly women. So, and yes, of course, you still had, you know, a focus of women in education and in, in health. But, you know, you also had a focus of women working and, and moving around and, and doing things, you know, much more autonomously. And again, until until not so long ago, when you found women in senior positions in the Republic of Yemen and certainly in the YAR, Many of them were, had been educated in Aden. I think I want to come to the 1990s, and uh, maybe a good point is to understand what led to the unification of the North and the South, because we began our conversation with this division that started at least since uh, mm. the fall of the Ottoman in 1918. And then, you know, obviously, there were differences, hostilities, you, you write a lot about in your book, what led to the unification? Basically, a whole host of factors led to the unification. One very important one, which is extremely important to remember today, is that it was very much a popular desire. I mean, you met Yemenis everywhere in Yemen who really, really wanted unity. So this was something that was, you know, a response to popular uh, demand. At the same time, you had both regimes, both in Sana'a and in Aden, which were in crisis. The 1986 civil war in Aden, which was really a faction fight at the top of the Politburo, had really made that regime lose a lot of its credibility, if not most of it. And although, you know, the reforms that they took immediately afterwards were, you know, were giving free speech, were allowing multi-parties, etc. But basically, because they had lost credibility, they, they really were in a very weak position. And at the same time, the Saleh regime, which had been in power since 1978 in Sana'a, you know, was also in crisis. It was partly in financial crisis, but also in social crisis, because there were much more demands for democracy, and there were a lot of demands that really called for uh, changes in the, the regime and people were not happy. And so in a way, you know, the, the two leaderships got together to, to do, to have unity. Again, I think both thought that they would dominate the United Unification process or the post-unity process. 
Um, obviously, one of these were very wrong, as we later found out. But it was so it was a very popular move. And that was something that really, you know, responded. And of course, you know, the end of the Soviet Union played a role and the sort of unification of Germany, though they mm. didn't really play a role in the sense that it was almost at the same time. Uh, but other, you know, other crises and, and international influences, you know, play, played a role. But primarily for Yemenis, it was it was really the the happening of a dream. I mean, you... I, I don't remember meeting many Yemenis either place. I mean, at that point, I had lived and worked in both states, you know, who weren't incredibly happy about unification and who had fantastic dreams about what it would bring and what it would do. And I mean, very simply, I mean, the, the more crude aspects is that, for example, you know, most people in the YR were, or at least, most, I can't say most, but many, many people in the YR were hoping that what would happen is that the uh, the PDRY's family law, which we've just discussed, you know, would, would dominate with respect to women's issues. And on social issues, they also expect, hoped that the South Yemeni's law on GATT would prevail, which restricted its use at weekends and holidays as opposed to a daily basis. And of course, what happened was the opposite, which is the YR law, family law, was imposed on the South, and uh, GAT spread like wildfire throughout the country <laughs> on a daily mm -hmm. basis. But you know, those were certainly hopes of more of people who had more concerns. I mean, for for the women's situation, you know, I think that was a very widespread hope for anyone who who really had any concern for women's issues. I want to come to the cultural social uh, movements including the Houthi movements uh, of the, uh, starting with the 1990s but if we, if you can briefly tell us a little bit about the economic implication of the unification because socialism was under serious challenge uh, globally uh, in this period during the 1990s and in your book you are very critical about prevalence of rural large landowners formerly tied to the Sali regime, eventually taking power up things like uh, water control management, using remittances and subsidized fuel and equipment to uh, you know, unregulated pumping that has also triggered the water crisis. So um, I want to understand if the unification, if would it be fair to think of the unification as also um, putting a lid to socialism and pushing it further towards a unregulated market economy? Um, to a large extent, I'd say yes. But I think, you know, there's, I'd put a number of sort of comments to your comment. You know, one of them, one of the first things that, that made major economic crisis uh, immediately after unification was the Iraq, uh, the Kuwait-Iraq situation. Because, you know, remittances to throughout Yemen from workers in Saudi and other Gulf states had played a very, very major role in household economies and including in, in, in development and agriculture and all that, which was not entirely for large landowners. I think you have to split, you know, the benefits that, that came to small landowners and or to basic ordinary people and the ones and the large landowners, which I think is a rather separate issue. We should talk about that separately. But basically, a very large number of Yemeni families and households in both the PDRY and the YR were extremely dependent on remittances from the Gulf and from Saudi. And with the, the, the Yemen Arab Republic's vote against the U.S., intervention at the United Nations in September 1990. The immediate result was basically the, it, it wasn't actually an expulsion of all the Yemenis from Saudi because at that point, most Yemenis who came with YAR passports, and that included a lot of South Yemenis who'd gone and picked up YAR passports on the way, you know, had a special status in Saudi Arabia. So they could work in Saudi Arabia without a kafil, without an agent, without the, the different conditions that people from other countries had. So what the Saudis did is they just cancelled this and made said they had to have the same conditions and basically pushed people out. So about 800,000 people right. came back to Yemen, which, you know, 
if you if you multiply if you assume each one of them was supporting a household of six to seven people, you're talking about you know more than half the total population of of Yemen at that time. At the time of unification, there were about eleven million, between eleven and twelve million Yemenis altogether. You're talking so, about four to five million. Well, I don't know. We first, uh, we first is, uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about, you know, half the population, depending to some extent, at least on, on these remittances. So not only do the remittances stop, but on top of that, you have this 800,000 of people coming home without jobs. And so, so that created an immediate crisis, you know, economic crisis of enormous proportion. And on top of that, which I forgot to mention, is the, the international support and international aid was cut, you know, more or less 100 percent. I mean, I forget the exact figures, but it was an enormous cut. And I mean, the U.S. ambassador said to the Yemeni ambassador at the U.N., you know, that this is the most expensive vote you've ever made, you'll ever make. And that. Uh, I think it probably was, you know, there's no doubt. So so you suddenly had the country, you know, deprived of, of its two major sources of foreign exchange. I mean, yes, you still at that time you still had oil exports which were rising and it was still the early days of oil exports, but still, you know, you're talking and, and again the oil exports from Yemen were never enormous, you know, the maximum you know, you've never had major production of oil in, in, in Yemen. It, the highest it got up to was four hundred thousand barrels of oil per day. You know, the Saudis are producing eight or nine million. So, you know, the Emirates are producing two and a half to three million right now. So, you know, you're talking about a totally, you know, an enormous disruption to the economic system and, of course, to the to the international assistance. Now, I think you can be very critical of the type of international assistance in development, and I certainly am. But, you know, and, and I certainly think it could have been an enormously better. But the fact is that it disappearing had a big, big impact on, on living conditions. And the only way it was restored was in 1995, when basically Yemen submitted to all the IMF conditions. And as we know, the IMF conditions are not exactly such as to help development in the country. They basically tend to, in my view, hinder development, if anything. So, you know, so you had this built in element. On the other hand, you know, yes, the South had a more socialist economy and the North had a more capitalist economy prior to unification. But you had a public sector in the north and you had a public sector in the south. So it wasn't a totally clean cut, you know, one's all public and the other one's all private. You know, you had both. So so mixing them or getting them together, you know, could would not have been a major disruption. I mean, what was a big disruption was, you know, the law that basically Ali Abdallah Saleh said, which was decree 45, I can't remember the number now, you know, which basically supposedly returned all the private, all the nationalized lands and housing and everything to their previous owners. But in fact, a lot of it didn't go to the previous owners. It went to, you know, various, basically his mates and friends, where, where, wherever they came from. So you created a major crisis in, in the rural sector, you know, basically by ending the, the most of the rural agriculture in the south had been by in two cooperatives and also through straight farms. So there were some private farms, particularly in the western highlands. Uh, but, you know, basically by depriving all these people of the land that they had had for, for 25 years or longer, you know, suddenly recreated an enormous group of people who were dispossessed and who were landless and who either worked as sharecroppers or as casual laborers, but who were very, very dramatically impoverished. Also at a time when a lot of the social services were cut, when a lot of the other, you know, benefits that they had had from subsidized foods, etc., were cut. So you can see why and how, you know, this large group of people felt disenfranchised and felt they had lost out from unification, you know, very quickly within a few years. One of the interesting things I found in your in your sec, uh, uh, in your uh, other book that I read, um, I, I think, uh, or, or perhaps in an article that part of 
the funding, uh, the Western funding also came in after um, Yemen supported the uh, war on terror uh, in, in Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, so was it true? Um, I'm not sure that I... I said that. I I mean, what has what what happened? I mean, if you look at the per capita development aid in Yemen throughout, it was very very low. I can't remember the figures of hand, but you know, if you really want, I can look them up and send them to you. Uh, but it was it was a very very low rate, and and the aid once it turned into development aid after twenty fifteen increased very considerably. But what did change in in the late 90s and early 2000s is there was a shift from development aid into agriculture, health, education, and those sectors towards security. So what mm -hmm. was happening is that instead of financing agriculture and rural development projects or, or schools or what or education training or whatever, you know, suddenly the, the the West and particularly the Brits and others were financing training the police and training counterinsurgency and and a lot of money was going into the right, right, into yeah. the military. So so that was a definite shift and and you know it had already happened before two thousand and one because. You know, as somebody I know put it, you know, is that the U.S. never had a Yemen policy. All they ever had was a counter-terror policy. And you right. could say you could probably say that's still true today. Uh, so, you know, you, ha you, you had uh, certainly a shift, but overall the per capita support in development support, you know, was very low. And again, I mean, you know, it was very low and it's remained low and it's only increased with the humanitarian crisis. But even being low, the division, instead of going to what I would consider the development issues, you know, as we said, health, education, agriculture, industry, whatever, it went to the military mm -hmm. and to, to the police. So, you know, that, that's another, in a sense, another way of constraining the country's development in the long run. I think this is a right segue into the cultural political side uh, since the 1990s. And uh, one of the shift that appears to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the entry of some sort of revivalist religious movement, uh, you know, since the 1990s. And, and the Houthis are in the news. And that's also one of our goals to understand them. So if you can... Uh, walk us through the division between the Jaidis, Shia in the north, and the Shafi Sunnis in the south, and how did this pan out in the 1990s? And then walk us walk us through the civil war or or, or the war Houthi war from 2004 to 2010. Okay, well that's a fair amount to be getting on with. <laughs> um, I think the first thing to remember is that, you know, Yemen does have two branches of Islam operating. One is the Zaidi branch, which is mainly in the highlands. So it's not it's not a north-south divide. You know, for example, the whole coast, Red Sea coast, is uh, is Sunni, Shia, uh, sorry, Shafi'i. Uh, so basically the Zaidi area is really this sort of pocket of, of highland area starting at the around the Saudi border and going about as far as... as as Yarim or thereabouts. In, in Would it the, be fair in, to um, understand them as tribes? I, I know that's a problematic category. No, 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 that's a separate issue. <laughs> I mean, the same tribes can be both Sunni and, and Shia. <laughs> so, it, it, I mean, ge you have a geographic, I mean, why they, they started, I, I cannot answer. Uh, but basically, you know, so you have the Zaydis who are a branch of Shia, who are fivers and not twelvers, unlike the Iranians. And the rest of the country is Shafi'i, which is, again, a branch of Sunnis. Now, traditionally, oh, sorry, I hate using the word traditionally, but, you know, in the past, there were there were very few differences between them. I mean, theologically and in other respects, the differences were minimal. They tended to pray in the same mosques together at the same time. And, you know, and basically there were no fun. There was no conflict based on religion going on. Um, there is a history that particularly in the Zaidi Highlands, which didn't, don't totally correspond to the states, but, you know, the, the dominant elements and I mean the the imams and even later on the, the leaders of the Republican movement, you know, were all Zaidis. 
And so that that had an impact on on the situation. But, you know, it it wasn't in any sense a religious divide. What you and you also had and have, you know, uh, major political movements that are Islamist. I mean, for example, the, the Islah party is, you know, partly considered the the Yemeni version of Muslim Brotherhood. But I mean, it is basically autonomous and it is, you know, but it is an Islamist party. And so and the, and in the in Zaidi land, you could say that in the late 80s and early 90s, there had been a major proselytizing effort from the from the fundamentalist Sunnis, I basically close to Wahhabism, who had come back from Saudi Arabia and who developed basically a revivalist uh, Zaidi movement, which eventually became the Houthi movement. I think you write about the Dar al uh, Hadith Institute's role in this. Yes, there was the there was the Dar al Hadith, which was created by a guy called uh, Wadiri, who was a Zaidi, um, and he went to Saudi Arabia and converted to Wahhabism. He basically felt he hadn't been well treated by his colleagues, and then came back. And the reason he installed his Dar al Hadith in the middle of of basically the heartland of Zaidism is because that's where he came from. So it was his village, which is really very near Saada. But that expanded and it grew enormously, and and it had you know Yemeni students from all over the place. It had students from all over the world as well. So, you know, I think there's a book by a Frenchman who went there. Uh, so you had, a, you know, you so basically you had this rise of, of you had this rise of, of Zaidi fundamentalism, which basically became the Houthi movement on the one hand, and you had the rise of the Sunni Salafi movement, uh, which, you know, came on the other hand, which basically also challenged the Islah party. Um, and which has, you know, cr produced some of the current separatist factions are basically populated in terms of their ground, their, their leaders and their members as basically being Salafis who descended because once the the, the Dar al Hadith was closed in in where it was, it then spread and it had other branches in another set of locations. I mean, in a place called Maabar and a place in Fush in the south and various other locations. So you had this this rise of of basically of more fundamentalism in both the 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 Shafi and the Zaidi areas, and I think that exacerbated things. Now with the Houthi movement, which had you know it's it had its six wars between them and or between them on the one hand against the Saleh regime in two thousand between two thousand and four and two thousand and ten. You had a, a you know a group where basically at every one of these episodes the the Houthis became stronger and they developed more and more. Not all the people who were with them were with them for deep ideological reasons. Some of them were with them simply because they were against Saleh or because the way Saleh was behaving, or sorry, not him individually, but his his troops and his commanders and and leaders were behaving, was really alienating people more and more. So they joined the other side, which was the Houthis. So that that they it really expanded and became much more powerful, and each of these wars ended with a kind of ceasefire, and each one broke down. The reason the one in twenty ten didn't break down is because in twenty eleven you had the popular uprisings. In which the Houthis joined, and they were amongst the the groups that had tents in the you know in the different cities and in the different areas, and and they expanded, and then you know you had the the sort of transition movement and the national dialogue and other events that that basically gave them more strength because while you had this transition movement and the national dialogue, they were busy consolidating their power in their home area and expanding it, you know, in the area surrounding it. So that's why, you know, you had that particular movement rising. You also had more and more um, dissatisfaction and frustration from all Yemenis, partly with the with a political process, which was really paralyzed. I mean, Saleh had kind of, kind of fossilized it in a way and prevented, you know, basically prevented alternatives from emerging. So because of that, you know, when he tried to to postpone the elections that were supposed to happen in 2009, 
um, you know, he basically that alienated more and more people, including the parliament. So you had more and more discussions and more and more disagreements. And so you had an increasing level of popular alienation from the political process simply because people had kind of the idea that they really wanted a democratic movement. And and the, and the elections in Yemen had never been the complete farces they were in a place like Tunisia. You know, you it wasn't sort of 98% victories and you had a substantial number of MPs from non you know, from not from Salah's party, I mean, mostly from Islah, but also a few socialists and Ba'athists, etc. So you had a, you know, you had a much wider representation, though, you know, Salah made sure that he won, always won, but it wasn't quite the farce it was in some other places. But the fact that people had lost faith in that process, you know, really had an impact on the situation. And at the same time, you had an economic deterioration. You know, you had lower oil production, lower oil revenues, uh, less financial and development support, the population continuing to increase at a very fast rate. You know, no additional economic resources, further uh, beginning of the exhaustion of the water table you know, beginning of low, basically more and more difficulties economically. So people had a, an increase, were being increasingly impoverished. So you had an uh, economic impoverishment, you had political paralysis, you had the, the rise of the Houthis on the one hand, and you had the rise of the Southern Separatist Movement on the other, which we haven't talked about, but I've given a few explanations as to why people in the South weren't happy. So. Um... There, there is a ceasefire in, uh, and please correct me if I, uh, if I jumble the timeline. There is a ceasefire in 2010. Then there are huge protests uh, in in 2011 as part of the broader Arab Spring, mm. and those uh, movements continue until 2015, where uh, a kind of a civil it turns into a civil war. Tell us a little bit about uh, how this process unfolds and what happens between 2015 and and the, and where we stand today? Well, I think I have to add a little bit to what happened between 2011 and 2015. Yes. I mean, the outcome of the, of, you know, the, the uprisings of 2011, one of their outcomes was a split in the, in the Saleh supporting movement uh, after the 18th of March massacre uh, by Saleh's forces. A whole section of those who were with him left including a guy called Lali Mohsen and his military forces and a number of other politicians. So for in the following months, you actually had a developing armed struggle and regular fighting between the Saleh forces and the anti-Saleh forces within the establishment, if you want to put it that way. And so, you know, it rapidly got to a situation where the international community, you know, the local ambassadors of the UN and the different U U Western states and the Gulf states felt that, you know, well, basically this isn't sustainable, something's got to be done. So they tried to bring about a transition and they tried to get Saleh to resign and failed until November when he was finally forced to resign as president. But because he was still very strong, he stayed in the country and stayed head of his party, which was the biggest party in parliament. And you then had what there was no, what was supposed to be a two-year transitional phase, supported by the G, what was known officially as the GCC agreement, though the GCC hadn't had that much to do with it, uh, but it gave it its name, and that gave it opportunities later on to. It would have given them opportunities to claim success, but given what happened later, <laughs> it wasn't exactly the success. And one of the so you had, and they had a government of transition which included half Saleh supporters and half the opposition forces. So that included both the traditional political opposition and what were known as the new forces from 2011, which are kind of youth, women, and and civil society. But this government was very ineffective. And another thing that was supposed to happen, was, well, which did happen, was a national dialogue conference, which had 595 people in it who were supposed to come up with a, a long-term political solution, possibly a new um, a new constitution to be implemented at the end of this transition period, which would have bring elections. And you had the election of 
Salers, vice president as sole candidate for transitional presidency, so from 2012 to 2014. So during that period, basically the economic situation continued to deteriorate. The government, given its divisions, which I've just explained, was completely ineffective. The National Dialogue Conference came up with some quite interesting things, but it didn't have any means of enforcing them. The Houthis built up their strength and their you know, control where they were, uh, you know, actively. But they were also in the National Dialogue Conference. You, have, you know, they were part of all this. And gradually, by 2014, you know, nothing had been solved. Um, the president's term was unilaterally extended for an indefinite period by the UN Special Envoy, who on whose authority is, you know, open to serious debate. And certainly various people into law can have a lot of fun trying to figure out all kinds of legal issues and on this matter. And the situation deteriorates. So in 2014, they came up with a new proposal. Particularly, they came up with a proposal of a federal state, which is something that the Saleh and his people were dead against. And the Houthis weren't particularly keen, but they had consolidated their power, and their main objection wasn't the principle of federalism, as far as I know. It was the fact that when the regions were decided, they were allocated a region which had neither access to the petroleum resources nor to the sea. So basically, they felt that they'd been sold down the river. By that time, they were already in alliance with Saleh, but they consolidated the alliance and basically overthrew the government and took over Sana'a in late 2014, early 2015. Sorry, I've gone on about this, but I think, you know, no. we, yeah, that, that was we, couldn't really, we couldn't really jump from 2011 yes. to yes. 2015 without saying a little bit of what went on, you know, what what moved from one to the other. So basically, in 2015, the Hadi government first was under house arrest. They escaped. They moved to Aden, which they decided to call the interim capital. And there the Houthis and the Saleh people chased them down. And so Hadi escaped to Saudi Arabia and basically never really took control of Aden as a, as a capital because... By 2017, he had dismissed some senior southern separatists who then basically ran the city. And there were two sets of, conf of military conflicts in uh, 17 and in, uh, sorry, in 18 and 19, and they were basically thrown out. So you now have a, a capital in Aden, which where the non 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 southern separatist elements are only there on sufferance occasionally and not always. And, you know, and but there are, of course, a lot of Southern separatist ministers. They're there and they can carry on. So what you had in 2015, you then had, and, and yesterday was the ninth anniversary of the beginning of the decisive storm operation, which was the military intervention from the Saudi-led coalition, which was basically Saudi Emiratis plus, you know, seven other states, some of whom dropped out and um, a few others never even joined in the first place. Um, and others, you know, sent their own troops as mercenaries. I mean, particularly Sudan was particularly prominent on in that aspect of things. And again, we can go into some details if you want to, but maybe it's not necessary. Tell us so a little you, bit about the U.S., yeah, well, so basically you have, you then had a, a, an internationalized civil war, which effectively ran from 2015 until early 2022, I think, when there was the first effective truce. And during that period, you basically, you had the Saudi Emirati coalition leading most of the military operations with very active support from the US and the UK and a few other European states. I mean, they they weren't physically involved in the sense that they did not fly the planes and they did not, you know, do, but they were in the command rooms and they provided the intelligence and they provided the satellite information and very, and all kinds of other things, let alone the weapons, of course, that they were selling. So, you know, so basically the, the U.S. involvement was very, was, 
it's indirect in the sense that it wasn't physically present in Yemen, but it's direct in the sense that it was, you know, actively involved in organizing and helping the Saudis and the Emiratis in doing what they were doing, which was primarily airstrikes. I mean, the, the, the ground level involvement was limited and very different between the Saudis and the Emiratis. And again, that's something we may or may not decide to talk about, depending on what you think. So in 2022, you had a, a truce which was organized by the see the, four, the fourth UN special envoy, which officially only lasted six months, but in practice, you know, more or less lasted until today, except that now we have the situation where there aren't Saudi Emirati airstrikes, we now have American and British airstrikes on Yemen. So you've had a period of almost two years, and basically from April 22 to January 2024, with no airstrikes. And you now have new airstrikes. Yeah. Of, a, of a slight, I mean, I am absolutely not a weapons expert, and I don't know anything. What I do know is from people who are on the ground and underneath the, these things that are coming down, is that the, the American and British bombs are much bigger and much noisier and shake things a lot more. So they're presumably a lot more destructive. Uh, but that's about all I can say about them, which you, any Yemen who's in any place near near where they're happening will be able to tell you that. Uh, I mean, the other you know thing, which of course is um, of some interest, is the fact that apparently the average you know missiles that or bomb or things that are sent by the Brits and the Americans cost between two and four million dollars a piece, whereas the ones that are, the Houthis are firing onto the Red Sea cost around two thousand dollars. So it's um. You know, financially, it's a lot more expensive for the Americans and the Brits. I mean, they've got a lot more money than the Houthis, true, but still. I think we are coming to the close. I still, I know it's getting late for you, but if you can very quickly respond to, or or tell us a little bit about the role of Iran uh, in this conflict, whether they have a role or not. And this is also somewhat tied to this perhaps irritating question for you, but it's it's so much in the media, which is that the Houthis are the Iranian proxies and what mm. they are doing in terms of intervening in the Red Sea in, in the context of the uh, ongoing genocide, if you like, in Gaza. Yeah, uh, no, we, yes. we, do, we do have to talk about these things. I yes. think you can't really not talk about these things at this point. I think, um, you know, the first point to be made is that effectively, Prior to what has happened in the last few months, the Houthis had won the civil war. And there was, you know, and the Saudis had decided some years ago that they wanted out under any conditions and they were about to sign a deal. I personally have doubts as to whether the Houthis were willing to sign a deal, but then we're not in a position to verify this one way or the other. But the fact that the Saudis absolutely wanted to do so and had, had been pushing, and they've kind of, even in November, you know, after the Houthi strike started, they started trying to to still sign the agreement, but it just became more and more difficult, you know, with the Houthi intervention in the Red Sea. The second thing that must be remembered is that, you know, the Houthis have gained massive popularity nationally and internationally thanks to what they've done. But, you know, and although I think many people do agree that anything that can be done to assist the Gazan people and the Palestinian people is, you know, not a bad thing, given the situation and the genocide that's going on. At the same time, one does need to remember that the Houthis are not the type of people we want to have ruling us. I mean, those who have to live under Houthi rule are not having a good time. They are very autocratic and very authoritarian and certainly have no respect for human rights, whatever. But that doesn't mean that what they're doing in the Red Sea, you know, I mean, it's not effective in the sense that it's not stopping the war in Gaza, but it's certainly doing something which compared to what's been done by the other, by the Arab states in general or in particular is enormous. I mean, basically the Arab states have mouthed a few nice words you know, in some cases, less nice words. But, you know, beyond that, you know, they've been dropping food supplies, you know, on people's heads, killing them in Gaza instead of uh, f instead of forcing the Israelis to open the borders and let the trucks to. And the trucks, there's hundreds of them waiting on the other side of the border in Rafa, as we're told on a daily basis. And, you know, f forcing to allow them in would have solved the problem 
you know, there would there would not be a famine now in Gaza if the, this had happened. So to me, you know, they are all absolutely complicit to what's happened. And I think I was particularly, you know, stunned because the Emirates, for example, you know, have started a land route from from one of their ports to Israel so that the trucks of can supply the Israelis with food and whatever else they need, you know, without having to deal with the Red Sea. I mean, they, they haven't even stopped that, let alone broken diplomatic relations or done something, you know, more effective than that. I mean, even breaking diplomatic relations is peanuts, but still, you know, it's more than they've done. So in that sense, the Houthis, in terms of popularity in the Arab and Muslim world, are, are, are you know, way up, regardless of the fact that one has to remember that they are not, you know, they are not the kind of regime one would like to live with. So, and the, the situation is that, you know, they are continuing the 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 new airstrikes are giving them the opportunity of saying i mean they've always said that you know death to israel is and, and death to america is their top two items in their daily slogan and now they're they're fighting the americans directly so in a sense they this is what they want which is obviously not making life pleasant for the uh, you know for the yemeni population and it's going to make life more difficult for them in terms of you know the humanitarian situation there which is deteriorating i mean the humanitarian situation in yemen is very serious it obviously does not compare with that in gaza but it's still you know that doesn't mean that it's good so you have a very serious problem there and um, so, so really, you now have, and, and the the peace deal, which would only have been a deal ending the Saudi involvement and and involving the Houthis, and would not have give, benefited, you know, the majority of the Yemeni population or the internationally recognized government or even any section of the, you know, is basically at best frozen, in anticipation of a change. I mean, I think people that I talk to, you know. You, one chooses between frozen, coma, dead, you know, whatever, you know, it's hard to tell, but whether it can be revived, I don't know, because at the moment, you know, with the, with the, de with the declaration of, of, as a foreign, whatever it's called, you know, terrorist supported, I forget the exact terminology, you know, if the one of the element, big elements of the Saudi Houthi deal was that the Saudis would pay the salaries of every all the all the government staff, including the military of the Houthis, for six months to a year or longer, where they're hardly going to make bank transfers, you know, if if once they, once we have this designation, which we now have, so you know the the actual potential for this deal, which again would only have been a very first step to ending the Yemen civil war. It would not have ended the civil war. It would have ended the Saudi involvement in the Yemen civil war. But, you know, it would have been a first step. And at the moment, as I said, I think it's at best on hold. I'm sorry, there's some other bit of your question, but I, I've forgotten what it is now. Yeah, no, I think uh, my, my last question to you would be, I'm also interested in asking a personal question about what interest why uh, you became interested in, in in the region but i think uh the final question that i actually want to ask you is uh how do you look at the way forward obviously as you just said that uh the 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 the, the con renewed conflict in 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 gaza has also created a renewed dimension uh in in yemen uh but even without that if those things are settled someday we hope what we are getting at is uh, is is a disengagement of uh, the Saudis, probably a much greater say to the Houthis, um, some sort of uh, understanding between different fraction, the 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 the, the, the Saudi supporters, the Houthis. I don't know how how, how strong is the Hadith's uh, own supporters, but there are also other fractions. Uh, I also assume uh, there is a presence of uh, Al Qaeda in the in in the region. Um, so it's it's not a very hopeful uh, situation, as you said. Like even the Houthis are not internally very democratic. To even you know put it in a mild euphemized word, how do you, as someone who has spent so many years looking at this region, how do you look at the future? Thanks. Yeah. I, and I remember what I didn't answer earlier, which was the point about Iran. So maybe I should say something. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, Iran, 
you know, Iran's involvement with the Houthis was limited until 2015. I mean, there was some ideological connection. Um, the Houthi leadership and others, you know, went and did religious studies in Qom and things like that. Uh, but basically, with this war, it has increased enormously. It's increased ideologically in the sense that, sorry, that the Houthis want to differentiate themselves from traditional Zaydis. So to do this, they are integrating and importing kind of 12 uh, rituals into, you know, under their influence. So in that sense, there's more of an ideological influence. They are getting, you know, technical support for their some of the fancy weaponry. I mean, they have some ordinary and they're learning fast and they're building a lot of their own stuff, but they're still learning a lot and getting, I think, you know, some technical and even some you know, bits of technology to for their more sophisticated weapons. There's been a lot of talk, and it seems to me likely that, they, you know, they did get some help from the Iranians in terms of identifying targets in the, in the Red Sea. So, you know, they are acting independently, but they are close to the Iranians. And indeed, as you were saying, the Iran-backed Houthis is, uh, you know, has irritated me considerably. And in one article, I, I tried to put it as Iran-backed Houthis in a single word, you know, no, no colons, just one word, Iran-backed Houthis. And when the when they published it and they hadn't done it, I said, well, why didn't you do that? They said, oh, our, our our technical system just refused it. It wouldn't accept it. You know, it just it just you, we couldn't do it. You know, the advantages of AI, I suppose. So, you know, the, the main thing is that, yes, the Houthis are allied with Iran, but the Houthis are their own agents. They're doing what they're doing because they want to do it. When they agree with Iran, that's fine. Ahlan was Sahlan, they do the same thing. When they don't agree with Iran, they do what they want, and the Iranians are just left on the side as everybody else. Um, to what extent the Iranians are perfectly happy about what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea, I don't know, and I wouldn't like to speculate on that. So to get back to your, your final question is, I'm always very bad at predictions. Um, and I... That's I, probably a sign of wisdom. I really, I mean... I live like many, many other people in constant sadness and increasing desperation of whether I'll ever be able to go back and do, I mean, what I've always liked to do in Yemen is work in the rural areas and go and listen to people and work with them and things like that. Well, now, I mean, even, even if there was peace tomorrow, half the place has been mined and it's not just not safe to walk around you know, or, or even drive around. And, you know, I'm also not getting any younger, so I probably would do more driving than walking, but even that doesn't make it safe. Um, I mean, you know, I I think, the you know, the, the Houthi-Saudi deal is something that the Saudis certainly still want. And it's very interesting to note that neither the Saudis nor the Emiratis are saying anything against what the Houthis are doing. And I've read a number of things suggesting that they've even prevented the Americans from using their, their, you know, their territory or the goodies that they have in their country to launch against the Houthis. So they are, you know, because, because or despite the fact that they're doing nothing, they feel quite unable to say anything bad about the Houthis who are doing something. And so I think this situation, you know, will persist for a while. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that if if the Gaza war ends and, and there is a ceasefire, you know, the Houthis will stop what they're doing. But they will they will stop what, I mean, number one, the prospect of it stopping, I think, you know, it, it's definitely from what we watch every day and we hear every day and the fact that the Americans are saying lovely words and even not not vetoing a UN resolution, but they're not stopping sending the weapons, they're not stopping the bombing, they're not stopping any of the things that are keeping the Israelis going. So so you know the and prospect of this seems... ending is not is not is not tomorrow, let's put it that way. Even it seems Israel doesn't care because the, the in addition went... to that, Israel doesn't care one way or the other what the Americans. Well, they they may not care what the Americans say, but they would care if the bomb stopped coming. Yes, I mean if they don't have anything to drop and to shoot with, that will affect them. 
you know, very effectively. And the one time, I think it was Bush, I forget it was Bush Sr. or Bush Jr., who actually said to them, we'll stop the supplies tomorrow if you don't do X. They stopped whatever it was tomorrow. I, I was reading about this last week. So anyway, you know, so the, the assuming that somehow the, the Gaza situation ends before the rest of the area completely blows up, because let's remember that the people in Saudi and in you know, not necessarily so much in the Emirates because there's eighty percent foreigners, most of whom aren't even Muslims, but they might care to some extent. You know, places. You know, if if it stops before everything else blows up, the the Saudis could probably try and revive the deal with the Houthis. How they'd sort out the designation and the finance thing, I'm sure that they'd find some way around. But you know, it still leaves the Houthis in a much stronger position ideologically, militarily, they've been recruiting right, left and center. People are coming to join them, you know, in the hope of going to fight in Gaza. And so, you know, and, and militarily, and the internationally recognized government are amongst the only people I have come across, you know, anywhere, who are basically asking the British, the Americans, please do more. And, you know, and help us defeat the Houthis. Now, again, you know, although there are a few Americans in, in Yemen and have, they've been there for years, and there's a lot of rumors of a few Brits, I mean, military who are there as well, um, they haven't been directly involved. Um, but, you know, what they're asking for, I mean, they, they, and, and they, that's even the different factions of the internationally recognized government, are all asking for, we want weapons, we want training, we want intelligence, we want all kinds of things. Basically, we want everything except people on the ground. And, you know, if they get it, that, that's just going to worsen the fighting. I mean, it's going to revive the fighting, which has more or less stopped. And if you look at history, I mean, let's look at Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, the prospects don't look good. So, I'm, I'm you know, I, I mean, I find I can see, you know, I can see this. I mean, the Saudis are out. You know, they may be not be out formally and they may not be out you know, it's, they haven't got the sign and sealed and television pictures and nice, you know, nice event with flags and people standing up and whatnot, but they're basically out regardless. And, you know, we'll be left with the Yemen civil war and we're left with the Yemen civil war with a divided and weak anti-Houthi movement and an em empowered Houthi movement and worsened humanitarian situation and worsening crisis. So it's really difficult to to see anything really in any way positive to to end up with, other than hope. I mean, I, I'm always saying hope, you know, we can hope. <laughs> Gramsci popularized the phrase pessimism of intellect and optimism of will. Um, if I can take one last minute, I promise, because I, we like to archive uh, people from around the world uh, through the kind of our goal is to build the largest video archive of people from the left. So if we can end on this personal note about what uh, what drew you to the region? When I read your book on, on socialist Yemen, I see there was a lot of ex excitement, there was a lot of things going on, but these are things I see through your book. Not many people who think about going to Yemen and study the region. I mean, even socialists and leftists, they are they have this more bigger fascination of the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, and so on. Um, you were born in Europe. I, I suppose you studied in the UK. Uh, what what uh, brought you to the region, apart from the fact that it must be very frustrating to see what is going on? Hi, my name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider donating for the cause. Link is in the description below. Also, if you are not able to do so, don't feel sad. You can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades. Finally, don't forget to hit the subscribe button.